Welcome in, everybody, for another episode of the unofficial WCC Hoops podcast. I'm Zach Farmer. Uh, Before we get into anything, be sure to hit that subscribe button and like the podcast on your favorite streaming services and then also on YouTube. Really exciting episode uh, for this one. We're going to be talking with uh, Rocco Miller from The Bracketeer, obviously like one of the better bracketologists out there, also kind of the scheduling guru. it within the college basketball space. So we'll talk to him about what, how he kind of feels about the schedules that the, some of the conference teams have put together. Obviously we still have some final pieces to fill in here and there, but we have so, largely the, the schedules of the important games. Like we know Santa Clara is done. We know Washington state is done. We know St. Mary's is done. Gonzaga is nearly there. USF is nearly there. So a lot to kind of get into as far as like who is going to be kind of what, how those schedules are going to help these teams out. So it'll be great to talk to Rocco about that, how he sees uh, this all shaking out once we get to the real games in just a couple of months that we're getting closer and closer uh, to the start of the season. But just a couple of announcements, actually a couple of them, um, or just a couple of notes I want to bring up that are tied to San Diego. Uh, so first, I'm going to mention that uh, San Diego did announce uh, over the weekend that they have completed their uh, multi-million dollar investment upgrades into Jenny Craig Pavilion, which does include a new video board uh, in addition in addition to uh, light speakers and then also upgrades to locker rooms and coaching offices. So a really good kind of sign for uh, the Jenny Craig Pavilion and USD as they continue to upgrade their facilities, as everyone continues to kind of try to uh, do the same throughout the course, throughout the conference. So again, with San Diego and Pep, again, and this comes off me talking about just a few weeks ago about Pepperdine's upgrades and what they're planning to do. Uh, San Diego, Jenny Craig Pavilion is a, is a good facility and it was nice to see again, one of the, still one of the newer buildings in the WCC get a, get a facelift uh, before uh, the coming season. Another San Diego note uh, is that they will be taking on San Diego, or sorry, they'll be taking on Arizona State again. Uh, so second straight year, the Toreros will be taking on uh, the Sun Devils. And this was a game that a year ago that really kind of was the eye opener uh, as they were able to, to kind of steal one from Arizona State at Jenny Craig Pavilion. So this is a this is a, another big opportunity for San Diego going into this year. Obviously that roster has almost completely overturned as well. So there's going to be a lot of new pieces, but we saw Steve Lavin really put together a, like really get them to develop quickly in the early part of the non-conference. Yes. You could say it was like, it was a soft schedule, but by the time they got to Arizona state, they looked like a good team and they were a good team. They beat that Arizona state squad. So that game is going to be taking place. I'm taking a look at the schedule right now. That's on December 3rd, and that's going to be in, and that's going to be at Arizona State. So again, like kind of like the end of the back to back. So that will be a road trip for them. Arizona State uh, oddly has a lot of WCC teams on their schedule already. So almost like they're playing a mini WCC uh, slate. They have Santa Clara on early November, they'll be taking on Gonzaga. Uh, they will have an opportunity within the, uh, the Accrisure Invitational to take on St. Mary's that still, it's going to be either St. Mary's or USC. Then yes, I mentioned San Diego, but then also they're going to get Grand Canyon uh, in the middle of November. So a future WCC opponent in that mix as well. So I kind of half joked that Arizona State clearly just joined the wrong league because they ended up just playing the WCC schedule. They could have just stayed out west. Um, But as we kind of get into the rest of the schedules, I think it's really important to kind of note that a lot of times schedules are put together based on what 
the coach thinks is going to be happening. And I think Gonzaga is a good indicator or not indicator, but a good example of that over the last two seasons where last year we saw that while they still had those, that big punch on, on their non-conference schedule, it was wedged in between or like in between each of those big matchups, they had those maybe what you would call a cupcake game or a far easier game uh, than they, than they would have otherwise kind of sprinkled in a little bit more. It was, you had UConn, then you had a break. You had, uh, was it, you had Purdue and a break. It's like, so, so there was like, you mixed in the easier games within the harder games, which I think that was more of an indicator of what, what that team still needed to accomplish. That was a, almost a brand new team a year ago, a lot of new pieces. So there was going to be some growing pains. And, I, and that kind of indicates like you would think that there's some balance or as this team starts to grow and grow. Going into this year, though, this is a team that brings back most of the pieces from a year ago, brings in some great transfers who are going to help round out that group. But this is a group that should hit the ground running. There should there are going to be fewer growing pains going into this year than there were a year ago. And that's why you now see a schedule like Gonzaga's that is just going to be gaunt, is running the gauntlet uh, this time around. As we start to finalize that, it's going to be it's going to look like maybe the best if not one of the definitely one of the best if not the best non-conference schedule out there and obviously we're going to take into account that uh over the last week or so we're also given the announcement that steel venters will be missing the course of the season uh, with a torn acl second straight season ending injury or back to back years where he has had a season ending injury before we've ever played a game and this is the sort of thing you just feel terrible uh, for for any athlete who goes through this because the one thing like you can you can control things that happen on the court to a certain extent and and show who you're going to be but when it's taken away from you like this multiple times over it it really is just heartbreaking to kind of see this happen uh, to a guy who going from Eastern Washington moving up to play at Gonzaga and going into a year ago he was going to be that starting three this year going in. He probably would have been coming off the bench, but in a key role and it really stinks. It really just like, like no matter who you root for, this is not the, you don't like seeing this happen to, to athletes, especially younger athletes who have, still have so much opportunity and potential to actually do some pretty great things. So a tough one for Gonzaga, a tough one for steel, Tough, tough for Steel Venters. It does sound like he's going to uh, going to work through recovery, return next year. So we will see uh, what the Gonzaga squad looks like. Again, there's going to be a lot of pieces not here from this squad that are going to be that this the Gonzaga squad, this Mark Few team is going to have to fill in a lot of gaps. At the very least, now Steel Venters kind of almost slots right in uh, to being one of those, uh, assuming he can get all the waivers and everything else, uh, which you would think he will. So going into this for Gonzaga, the, the one thing, I don't think this harms Gonzaga nearly as much as it harmed them a year ago, because again, I mentioned that he would probably was going to play a little bit more of a role off the bench than he was going to be a starter. So yes, does that mean that Dusty Stromer will step into those minutes again? Probably. But, I, but from what we saw, there's going to be for, from a year ago and also the pieces they brought in, Michael Ajayi, uh, Khalif battle, there's going to be less expected of Dusty Stromer, and the pressure is, I think, going to be off of him. You did see certain, you saw the progression toward the end of last season um, as he got put into a role that was probably a little bit more fitting for him as a freshman. He's going to be probably now given maybe a little bit more of a role, at least it's going to be more defined, I think, going into this year. So I think you're going to see that growth. You're going to see, see Dusty continue to have opportunities to kind of to do well in the situations he's going to be given. I think there you're not going to see him thrown into a scenario that is maybe over his head at this stage. Uh, so I think this is to an extent, almost a good thing that now there's not, he was going to be buried. I think a little bit more on the depth chart had 
Venters been available. Uh, but now without Venters, he's going to step in a little bit more. And I do think going into sophomore year, he's going to have a greater opportunity to kind of do, do some really good things. All right. With that said, we're going to get into uh, our conversation with Rocco Miller, uh, and he's going to tell us all about what he thinks that these schedules for the at least the top tier of the WCC is going to how these schedules are going to help these squads reach a potential NCAA tournament. Always happy to bring on Rocco Miller uh, from the bra- from the bracket tier who. He, any everything college basketball when it comes to schedules, the bracket. Uh, he he knows he knows it all. Uh, Rocco, thanks for hopping on. Um, as we get, we're about a couple months before the season begins. How how has your summer been? And uh, how excited are you to finally? We're getting closer and closer to actual games. Zach, good to be back on with you. Uh, summer's been great. Uh, been been working on basketball stuff mostly scheduling as you know uh throughout the summer so it feels like it's gone by fast didn't take any major trips but i did get to uh go up to canada for a few days last week that was pretty cool got more to come up there during the season so uh, stay tuned for that uh we do need to get some wcc teams up there in 2025 so that will be the next order of business up there but but yeah overall it's been good the weather's been nice mainly here in the bay when i've been here um and you know just really looking forward to getting to the games because i feel like i've been studying these rosters looking at different scheduling opportunities and i think the hardest part with the portal that fans may not realize is coaches are very reluctant to just take games when uh, even if they make sense on paper a lot of games actually they wish they would have gone back to june and, and taken are gone now uh, so you're still seeing schedules getting finished up as we approach september it's uh it, it just that date just keeps getting pushed back further and further every summer, and a lot of it has to do with all the player movement. We also have sixty-seven new uh, Division One head coaches. I believe that's a new record as well, uh, for various reasons. Most mostly due to firings, but there are a lot of guys moving up to Power Five that have uh, earned that opportunity, and then of course that creates tons of dominoes in the carousel, uh, and so that cr- that creates delays in scheduling because if uh, if a team like you know like a Vanderbilt or even a Pacific have three or four open scholarships. Do you really want to sign up to play against the unknown? Um, it, it makes, t- it just makes, it, there's about 20 reasons to say no to scheduling a game and no, only like one or two reasons to say yes. So it just creates a huge delay. Um, so I'm, I'm anxious for that to be over with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, it is, I mean, even think when kind of joked for years and years, how uh, St. Mary's almost seemed like they would wait almost until like the week before <laughs> to announce their yeah. full schedule. Um, but I mean, that's still true. Like I was talking with um, some of the coaches and yeah, and it's like, they still have a game or two here left the schedule. So we don't have full announcements for everybody, but at the very least, like we do have some full schedules already kind of like mapped out in the WCC. St. Mary's has released their full schedule. Santa Clara has released their full schedule. USF hasn't announced, but like they're very close to kind of being done. I think we know kind of the bulk, the ch- the bulk, the big games of what they're going to see. Gonzaga, obviously, we kind of we know largely what they're going to look like. As and let's start there with kind of like where we know at least this top tier of the WCC and what these teams, their schedules do look like. Uh, your initial impressions of maybe let's take the USF, Santa Clara, and St. Mary's grouping, and what your initial impressions of what they've been able to put together? Yeah, I think we'll start with Santa Clara. You know, I think I think actually just between the three, they were the most aggressive. Um, they really emphatically punctuated that by taking that game late at McNeese. Of course, that's a place that the majority of the country said heck no to. Um, Santa Clara jumped on it. They'll get a return game from McNeese, but we have no idea what. McNeese next year will look like if Wade will still be there. Uh, if if Wade's still there, it's going to be another. It's going to be two great games for Santa Clara. But for this year, uh, you know, unless there's an injury or two at McNeese, that definitely shapes up as a quad one opportunity. McNeese was pretty safely in the top sixty all last year. Uh, the Southland actually got a little bit better. They added Stephen F. Austin and and uh, UTRGV. I don't know if that helps, but Stephen F. Austin definitely does. And so they should have about four to five quality teams in the league. So. McNeese can actually afford to take a league loss or two this year and, and it might not hurt their net at all or, or not much at all. So um, I think that was a smart game to take. They're also going to go to Nevada. So those are two tough road games uh, for the Broncos. 
And then all, all, all in, I've got them down for nine, what I call strategic games, which are basically games that are not just, you know, low end division one buy games. Um, so even taking on Stanford at home is a big opportunity. Uh, getting Bradley out in uh, Vegas is going to be big. Bradley will be the pick to win the Missouri Valley. I'm pretty confident on that. Um, their their tournament is strong. They get TCU once again, a team that clobbered a couple of years ago down in Southern California. Now they get to play them again in Southern California. Uh, so we'll see if they can repeat that uh, performance. Obviously, a lot of different faces now. Uh, but in that same tournament, they, they might have a chance to play against Washington from the Big Ten or Colorado State, an always solid program from the Mountain West. They get a game in the first week against Arizona State. And Santa Clara is probably uh, definitely is the more experienced team. They're really only replacing Carlos Marshall, uh, so I think they have a nice edge in that Arizona State matchup. Uh, I'll be with them on opening night. Is my plan in the Pentagon? There's a nice triple header there. They'll play St. Louis. St. Louis, another beautifully scheduled game. Um, you know, Josh Schertz, new from Indiana State, brought a couple key players from that great Sycamore team, but. Um, by and large, that Santa Clara experience, I think those first two games to start the year with, with St. Louis and ASU, I think, I think they have the edge. Um, we'll see how it plays out. Obviously, both those teams are very talented. Uh, and so, yeah, so I count up uh, nine total games for Santa Clara. Again, there's no t- top 15 teams in, on that list, maybe not even a top 25 team. So that's the concern. Um, so Santa Clara, once again, and they've done the best they can. I talk to them often. Um, oh, once again, they'll have to be huge fans of all these teams to do well later in the year, uh, because otherwise these wins might just slip into quad three again. And I know that's been extremely frustrating for the Broncos the last couple of years. Um, with, with San Francisco, um, you know, a similar model, maybe not as aggressive in some ways, but they do get Clemson in their tournament in the first game. And I thought that was really important. Clemson, of course, coming off an elite eight. That would just be a big signature win early if the Dons can get that done in the semifinal round of the Sun, Sunshine Slam. Uh, they also have Memphis coming to uh, the Golden State Warriors arena. That's been on the books for a couple of years. That's a really exciting opportunity. Ideally, Memphis, you know, right now they're coming in 25th in Torvik. If they can perform anywhere around a top 25 net game, uh, that should easily be quad one. I believe the NCAA will treat it as a neutral, which is always a great advantage for the Dons playing there. Um, and then they also play at that Bradley team. They'll play them in a road game. So really good opportunity for that to be a quad one. That same St. Louis team comes to San Francisco, and so does Boise State, who has a lot of guys back. So, um, again, I think Santa Clara has got a bigger quantity of strategic games, but San Francisco might have packed a meaner punch just getting that chance with Clemson and Memphis. Um, so a lot to be excited about with both. And then with St. Mary's, you know, um, they kind of – They've got this formula down pat, I think, now in the last three or four years where they go out and uh, have a bunch of good teams from mid-major leagues come in. So this year, that list is Towson, probably the pick to win the CAA. Chattanooga, good chance to win the SoCon. Akron, good chance to win the MAC. You get the theme here. So all those home games, um, typically St. Mary's performs well in. And even last year, they lost a couple of them, and they were fine by the end of the year. So it makes their team better overall. And they figured out in the net, like they're going to have games where they just absolutely suffocate teams and they'll make up for it in their net in other games if, it, if they don't have a good night. Um, and then I think in their, their games away from home, you know, playing Boise again up in Idaho, uh, they were comfortable doing that. I think their, their tournament's pretty manageable with USC in the opener. New Mexico is, uh, you know, they're going to try to hang on to tournament level, but they lost a couple of key pieces, as we know. Uh, and Arizona State's the other, other team in that. So. You know, and then they get Nebraska in the Pentagon. They go to Utah. Again, I, I think similar to Santa Clara, there's a good chunk of opportunities. Also, Utah State's visiting uh, here in Baraga. But, but uh, yeah, I, I just don't know if any of these teams will be top 25 teams by the end of the year. So um, St. Mary's will need to have a really strong record, I think, still. Uh, unlike, unlike the other years where they've gotten a chance to play Houston or, or even a San Diego State, I don't know if there's that strong of a team on this, on this list. Yeah, with those with those three, it does that was kind of like my initial impression as well. It's that like they're Santa Clara and St. Mary's put together good schedules. Like you have a lot of good teams on on there, but if there wasn't that that superstar team, like again, like St. Mary's had San Diego State on the schedule a year ago. Santa Clara had um they had the opportunities with Oregon and Ohio State last year. So you had some like marquee or Washington State as well. Uh, you had some like top top games that they were able to kind of point to and say, hey, like here's our 
a real big chance. But it does feel like, especially for Santa Clara, that they've set themselves up very well going into the year. Um, as like you look at what they're the roster they bring back and everything else, uh, that that it it's a lot. I really do kind of like like what each of them has been able to do. Uh, do you with the with those three teams? Because again, like I feel like roster wise, each of them ha- is in a little bit of a different position. Where maybe like going into this year, the St. Mary's squad is. Maybe not as like I think they felt like they were more comfortable going into a year ago because of how many guys they had coming back than maybe in they do this year. And do you think that there's anything to be said about the way the schedule is set up because you only returned I think it was two starters this year, where last year I think you returned all five or four yeah. of the five. Yeah, in St. Mary's specific case, I think the off season definitely started with some concern. Of course, seeing Mahaney and Jefferson hit the portal. That was uh, not not normal for St. Mary's, um, but I think they did a re- really good job adjusting. Uh, you know, they've they've been grooming some guys up. Of course, Jordan Ross, a big part of that story, but um, bringing in an Ashton Hardaway from Memphis, who's you know obviously got a great pedigree and been around success, and and uh, you know the the Arizona transfer uh, Maroskis, right? Like bringing in those guys, uh, you know, I think they'll they, once they saw them work out, practice, and gel with the guys that I think they started getting a little more comfortable. Um, I, I think I really think in the beginning, they didn't know how much they wanted to take on uh, schedule wise. And I think at the end they took on a little bit more, even though we didn't get those, those big uh, opponent names like usual. Um, but I do think at this point in time, they feel very strongly about their chances this year uh, about getting up to that same level, competing for the WCC ch- championship, being a top six seed or so in the tournament. I think all that's right in front of them still, and they've kind of figured out ways to tweak this thing. Um, so that's been good. Uh, but now I don't. I just don't know. You know, they're <laughs> the, the the funny thing about the NCAA tournament these days in the net area is it's such a big advantage for St. Mary's because, uh, like I hinted at earlier, you know, in so many of their results, they'll just absolutely suffocate good teams. Um, so I don't know where, who on this list is going to be a victim. I'm sure a handful of them will be. But they'll beat teams by twenty plus, and that are good teams that that are like top one hundred teams, and that will that will keep St. Mary's probably in the top twenty in net, uh, maybe even higher. We've seen them get into the top ten, and um, once the NCAA tournament is set in stone in terms of the sixty eight teams that are going to go, uh, seeding it, it, that has a lot to do with seeding, and that keeps pushing St. Mary's up and up and up. We saw them squeeze into a five a couple times now, so um, I, I think I think they've done it in a, in a wise way. Now we'll we'll switch gears and talk about Gonzaga because this is, they put together a schedule this year that is might honestly be maybe their toughest their best schedule they've ever put together a year year separated from where they kind of was it felt a little bit more balanced where you had kind of like your your kind of you had your great game and then you had an easier game great game easier game great game easier game and i think that was also like partly because of the roster that they had there were a lot of unknowns and this year this is a team that looks like it's going to be ready to go from day 1 uh kind of talk about like what they've been able to put together and honestly again is this the best one that we've seen mark few and company be able to to put out there good question i i you know that's more of an opinion based question i would yeah. say it's it's up there they've they've played big national schedules for for two decades now i i think at the top it's pretty similar but i i think to your point some of the meat in the middle like some of the games that fans might overlook um i think there's there's more quality right like you know getting that series with arizona state playing at san diego state's actually probably going to be one of their hardest games uh, but it won't get nearly the hype as like the UConn or Kentucky or UCLA games. So uh, yeah, no, I think it's it's loaded with with opportunity. Um, you know, I, I was on the Gonzaga podcast yesterday, and they had uh, you know revealed I revealed the news there that they're close to getting a game done with Baylor to open the season in Mexico City. Um, so that's a super exciting opportunity too. And I think you know I think much to your St. Mary's question, Zach. Gonzaga is kind of the opposite. I think they felt good about their team throughout scheduling with all the guys. We got Nemhard, Hickman, and EK back with Ben Gregg and, and Dusty and Huff. Like, and then you layer in a Khalif Battle who's played for Arkansas, played a lot of great years at, at Temple. Uh, Ajayi was a beast in this league. So, you know, whether he's ready to start right away or if he just, you know, dominates 
inferior opponents. You know, he's already proven he can do that. And I love this uh, Innocenti guy they brought in. He's like Tarleton's best defender, and he's only a sophomore. And Tarleton, a lot of people don't know about, but they finished second in the WAC last year, play a really extremely in-your-face, full-court, uh, high-pressure uh, defense that's uh, Billy Gillespie ball. So uh, getting some of that juice into Gonzaga's program is actually pretty exciting. So um, I think the only bad news just happened, you know, a couple of days ago with the Steel Ventures out for the season news. But I think overall, like when you're going into scheduling, if you can't feel good about this roster, you're never going to feel good about any roster because <laughs> um, the way they finished last year, you know, those are the, in any sport, like those are the teams uh, you want to kind of ride with entering a new season, uh, a team that ended strong, which they did. They dismantled a very good McNeese team in that first round game. And then of course, you know, uh, destroyed Kansas as well. Um, you know, so, so this team is primed and ready for a big run this year and, and they've all gelled and, and the pieces they brought in, I think, integrate kind of very naturally. Um, and I, I say you just take on the world when you have that, and that's what they're doing. So I think this is a, the larger topic here, I think, is for the rest of the WCC. I know we'll probably talk about bids <clears throat> in a little bit, but I think the, the key for the whole season is, you know, Gonzaga has at least nine strategic games, um, and their strategic games, of course, are the big dogs. It's not like, you know, Boise State and Colorado State and those teams. This is – uh, this is Kentucky, UConn, UCLA, Baylor, San Diego State. So, uh, and a chance to rematch with Tommy Lloyd in the uh, championship game of the Atlantis, which I know Gonzaga fans are going crazy about. Uh, and a rematch with Omar Malo in, in the semifinals with Indiana, if Indiana can beat Louisville. So, um, tons of big games coming their way. And I think the, the key to this thing is if they can go seven and two, maybe even six and three, with that, with that level of competition, it might not even matter too much which six or seven they beat. Just get get that kind of record. They're going to stay in the top five of the polls pretty much all year. They're going to be in the mix for a number one seed. And that's also going to create a much larger apple for the rest of the D WCC to try their best to take a bite out of. And that's been the biggest holdup with San Francisco, for example. They can never get past that Gonzaga or St. Mary's home. But if this is the year they can finally just beat them once, uh, if it's Gonzaga, I mean, that's going to take you from certain NIT future to back to the bubble. Um, and so if Gonzaga can create that big of a profile uh, for the rest of this league to try to take a bite out of, um, that's good for everybody. So let, let's even like start, start with and keep with that topic of like t talking about those NCAA bids. And I mean, I, I mean, we've seen the WCC with two each of the last few years, obviously Gonzaga St. Mary's they have been more or less locks for I mean, Gonzaga has been a lock, obviously, for 25 years. St. Mary's has been a lock uh, for the last few um, mm -hmm. to get in there. Is there a potential for a third or a fourth to get in? Um, and again, based on these schedules, we obviously need to see them play and everything else. But like, what what do you think are the chances that we can see or will see on Selection Sunday a third or fourth WCC team get into this mix? And is and is there any other team outside of USF Santa Clara that could actually be that that other team. Yeah, I mean, I, I never want to say never. I, I I've been dying to see this happen for for too long. <laughs> but uh, San Francisco obviously pulled it off in Golden's last year, and you know, so they've they've got that at least they they've got that one example to to try to build off of. And I know they just keep hitting their head against the wall in these Gonzaga St. Mary's matchups, and and some of those matchups has just really destroyed their overall resume with you know net numbers and all that. Um, they were able to, at least when Gold, in Golden's tournament year, uh, they were able to, you know, they lost a heartbreaker to St. Mary's. They should have won. They had a big lead in the first half. and uh, But even just losing that game close helped them. Um, so San Francisco's got to get a, over that hump. You know, I like their team quite a bit. They added a great rim protector in the, uh, the center for UTSA. So I'm excited to go see them practice. Haven't seen them yet uh, this offseason. Um, but but yeah, they're right there in the mix. And we talked about their schedule. Santa Clara, same thing. So many guys back, but they just keep hitting their head against the wall. They take on so many of these games where teams rank like between 40 and 80. They're hard games. And what ends up happening is they end up losing three or four of them. And, and a couple of those three or four will uh, end up falling apart later in the year. So they've, they've really tried hard to hedge those types of games. Like they won't take games with teams like UC Santa Barbara anymore or or um, I, I hate to call them out because I like them, but, it, you know, some years they're like 200 and other years they're 
they're closer to 50. So it's risky to take some of these teams on because you don't know how they're going to finish. Um, but Santa Clara, again, I think for, for both of those teams, um, a win over Gonzaga and St. Mary's or one of each goes a, a long ways for the league to get three. And, and the other team I do have an eye on is, is Washington state. Um, you know, Washington state, of course, in the tournament last year with, with a whole different team. Uh, David Riley is one of the, uh, youngest coaches in the country, but a brilliant mind, analytical mind. And I, I've been talking to him for about four years now. So really excited for his chance to, to coach a team at this level. Um, you know, he brought basically his four best players from Eastern with him. Um, and they won a lot of games together. Uh, they, you know, at one point, I think last year, they were 15-0 and 0 in the big sky. So again, it's a different level, but these guys are used to winning. I think that matters quite a bit. They bring in, um, uh, you know, a young guy from Quinnipiac, uh, Vavers and, and Quinnipiac won a lot of games last year. So th- there's a lot of, a lot of winners on this team. Uh, you know, and I know Nate Calmese, he's projected to come off the bench still, but that guy, he was one of my favorite Washington Huskies last year, just from a talent and poise standpoint. He's a very productive player analytically. Um, so I, I think they have a very carefully constructed roster, maybe a year away. Uh, but obviously, you know, Cedric Coward's been an all big sky guy for years. Um, he, he'll be the leader. And Watts stuck around, um, you know, played a little bit last year at Wazoo. So, uh, and they got a couple of good freshmen as well. So I, I think, it, you know, Washington State's schedule is also pretty good. Like they, they went out and got a game with Bradley themselves. Bradley's playing the whole WCC, it seems like. But, <laughs> but they also got Boise State and they've got a, a really big opportunity to play Iowa in, in the second week of the season. Very curious to see how they do there. They'll have their Apple Cup game on the road, which will look like a really good quad one chance. And, Washington's got a lot of question marks themselves. They also go to Nevada. So they've, they built a very good schedule. You could argue this schedule might even be as good as San Francisco and Santa Clara's. Um, so they'll be in position if they can win enough games for sure. Yeah, that Washington State team. And again, like we've also seen like at least some very recent success of an Eastern – former Eastern coach, bring his guys and it worked for year one. And we, like we saw that at Portland with Shante leggings and he, yes. he bringing up some of those guys. So, so if anyone's questioning whether the Eastern Washington guys can play at the WCC level, we have evidence like there, there's already, we've seen it once. Now it's a matter of whether or not obviously like can, can Washington state and David Riley really kind of like one, have that success year one and then build off of that going forward. Um, is there a team that maybe is, could be a surprise uh, in this league because it, I mean it feels like the the top five, top six, or whatever seem pretty like well defined. But we saw last year San Diego kind of came out of nowhere. We've seen it in past years where we've had one team that no one actually predicted to do well just kind of jump out, especially early on. Do you? Is there anybody you see amongst the teams we haven't talked about uh, that could actually kind of sneak up on some teams? Well, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what Portland can do. I, I never want to write off Shante. I know he's a really good offensive mind, and they've really just got to solve that defense. I think Portland's finished last in defense in the league the last two years, so we'll see. And their and their two transfers they're counting on are coming from American and Elon. Uh, Max McKinnon was a great player at Elon, actually, but they've. I mean, those teams have lost a lot of games, so I'm just waiting for Portland to get that juice to uh, get a winning culture back and going like he had in his first year try to build off that. But I think the, the, the super sleeper that everybody has to kind of pay attention to is this Pacific team. And mainly because of head coach Dave Smart, I thought it was one of the most interesting and fascinating hires in the entire country uh, out of the 67 hires that were made. Um, so for those unfamiliar, Dave Smart is a Canadian uh, college basketball, which again, Canadian college basketball is not the same level as us. Don't get me wrong. But he's won, he has the highest winning percentage in Canadian college basketball history. He's won countless championships and eventually took the plunge. He used to coach the Carrollton team that has knocked off several uh, high major teams in exhibition games, if you remember their name, out of Ontario. Um, he took the plunge, I think, last year or the year before to join Texas Tech staff just to learn a little bit more about Division One college basketball, how it works here. Was under a great head coach there in Grant, uh, Grant McCasland last year. Uh, some One of the coaches I have tremendous respect for and now boom he's got the head coaching job at a place like pacific who needed a spark you know they're obviously struggling uh, resource wise compared to a lot of the other wcc i don't even know what they have really so far in nil 
uh, but he brought along with him an assistant coach I'm, I'm pretty good friends with him, Clay Wilson, both from Texas Tech. Those guys, if you follow their careers, Clay's a lot younger. They've won a lot of basketball games. And I think that alone is exciting. Um, and they brought in some very interesting pieces, like Elijah Fisher's from a losing program in DePaul, lost a lot of games, but he averaged over 10 points a game in the Big East. Um, and he's going to, you know, arguably, I don't even know if it's controversial at this point, but he'll have a better coach here at Pacific. And, um, you know, so they've got a lot of interesting players. They've got a, a player from the University of Victoria. They averaged 16 points a game and nine rebounds. Like, how does that translate? We have no idea. It could, he could be a beast. He could be awful. Um, and, and I'm, and I'm talking about Elias Ralph, if you couldn't tell, but like, there's, there's so many like really interesting pieces, but you know, you have a guy like Jefferson Koulibaly, who before he got hurt at SMU was expected to be one of SMU's best players. So there's some really good talent for a place like Pacific. Uh, Lamar Washington played at Texas Tech, just got stuck on the bench. A lot of talent there. Jazz Gardner from Nevada. I mean, this is, this is a very, very interesting team. It could go a million directions. But I do have a feeling that the uh, current Bart Torvik projection of 322, I I would uh, I would make a little side bet that they're going to be higher than 322. Yeah, I mean this specific team, I agree with you. I think they're going to be that team to watch. Yeah, and 322 seems low. Well, I guess there was only one direction to go for Pacific <laughs> a year ago, so they were definitely going to be better. Um, but they they have talent, and it's they're not they're going to catch somebody at least like i think they're going to catch maybe one or two teams off guard um as we go along all right rocco thanks for hopping on it's always great to chat with you and get a little bit more like sense of where we are and we're still we're still here in august getting close to college basketball season uh as the weather starts to get a little cooler it's like i am excited to guys get us back into game mode and i know you are too so thanks for hopping on and uh we'll definitely catch up Anytime, Zach. Great to be on with you again. Uh, happy se September. Enjoy some football until we get back into preseason mode. <laughs>